All right, it's about time to begin, eight o'clock. I um, want to thank everyone for coming for the next lecture in our e-lecture series. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, reminder, this webinar is for educational purposes only. All of the interactive features for attendees have been disabled to ensure optimal quality for all viewers. Uh, if you have any questions, you can see our um, email address here, emerymskradiology at gmail.com. If time permits, Dr. Greditzer has uh, agreed to do question and answer. Um, announcements will be made uh, for each lecture in terms of whether or not we're going to be recording, and this one we will be recording. Uh, another reminder, attendees have not been given permission to screen record any of these talks on the e-lecture series as they may contain material that's under copyright. Unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Tate Greditzer from the Hospital for Special Surgery. Um, he is a colleague of mine that I've worked with in the past. Um, he did his training in uh, Miami um, we were co-residents together, um, and he uh, then went on to do uh, a fellowship in musculoskeletal diagnostic and uh, interventional work uh, at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Um, he serves on the journal for uh, HSS Journal um, as an editorial position. Um, he also does um, a lot of speaking uh, around the country. Um, I was just telling him I was looking at his CV, and he really could honestly do an entire lecture series himself. He has so many lectures he's given on various MSK topics. Um, it's quite impressive. And in addition to being on the lecture series, uh, he's written and authored uh, first authorship on uh, several papers. He's given talks at conferences um, and he holds uh, positions on various committees. So we're really fortunate to have him taking the time to give us a talk today. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Greditzer. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. And hopefully this works. Okay. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about imaging of injuries in the National Hockey League. Um, I'm very fortunate here to work very closely with the, the Rangers and a little less with the New Jersey Devils. Um, and that's one of the hockey teams that we cover here. So we also get a lot of um, consults from players coming from all around the country because we have some very famous hip surgeons at our institution. So um, I'm going to show you guys kind of my experience in working with an NHL team and uh, hopefully get you guys interested. Let's see here. Okay. All right. I have no disclosures relevant to this topic. However, I am always looking for any kind of grant or anything like that, or if you work for a uh, device company, just let me know, because I would love to have some disclosures, and it's unfortunate I don't. Uh, the other disclosure is that there's gonna be lots of videos here. Um, I sh I'm gonna show you guys videos illustrating the injury mechanism. A lot of the videos I'm showing are of Ranger players, um, but then I'm gonna show you an MRI or an imaging study that's actually not the player's injury, um, exact imaging study, just to protect their medical record, but it's an injury in another player that was exactly the same and, and kind of go over how they were managed. So injuries in the NHL, when you, I recently just did a chapter uh, on NHL injuries and when I got together with the fellow, the orthopedic fellow who's covering the Rangers, he said, God, there's like nothing in the literature. It's like impossible to write a book chapter on this. And the reason is, is there's a lot of lack of descriptive data in the media. This is uh, why I was lecturing at the um, Mayo Clinic. I kind of brought this up for them on the Arizona Coyotes, who they cover. And this is how they describe their injuries. It's lower body injury, lower body injury, lower body injury. And that's just how the media does it. So if you, you know, if we do have an NHL season, it looks like we're going to, you can kind of pay attention to this when you look on ESPN, it's very poorly described. In my personal experience, what do we hear about in the media? We hear a lot about concussions. But concussions have kind of been very poorly described as well. So not only are concussions poorly described, but also are any other injury that a player has. This was a study that was done, probably the most comprehensive study looking at concussions in the NHL, which are very common. And basically the only conclusion they came to is that offensive players have a higher, have the highest rate of concussions and goalies have the least. Well, I think anybody here is listening to this could have told you that. 
So again, there's a lack of reliable and publicly available data surrounding concussions, but also um, any type of injury a player has in the NHL. This was probably the most comprehensive study I could find just looking overall at injuries. And this was in, published in uh, Switzerland at the University of Zurich. And this is from 1995. So what they kind of came out with was they found that knee injuries and sprains of the collateral ligaments accounted for the majority of these type of injuries that they saw in NHL players. And I've found that to be very true. So by far and away, the most common injury that I see is a collateral ligament injury. Shoulders, obviously not surprising, dislocations, AC joint separations, or a rotator cuff strain are also fairly common. And then also, sorry, groin injuries and injuries to the back, they said. So again, kind of keeping, I think hip injuries are very, very common in hockey players, and we'll just go through the whole gamut of, of everything. But what this study really missed, which I think is really important, is they missed this. And this is a common thing we don't really think about, and that's getting injured by the puck. So I'm going to show you guys in the ice. So when we got the radiograph, you know, we can see obviously there's a lot of lateral sided soft tissue swelling, but no fracture. But given his degree of pain um, and the severity of the injury, we got an MRI. Here the MRI is going to tell us a lot more of what's going on with him. So we didn't see a fracture in the radiograph. And we see what he's got here is a bone contusion here in his fibula. He's got some periostitis here that we can see. So really painful bone that he's got. And he also had a really cool thing here on this axial on the right. He's got a, a fusion and he's got a hematoma within his perineal tendon sheath. So again, the MRI just gives us kind of a little more sense of what's going on and how badly this player is injured. So when I was a fellow, I, uh, I looked at this and after for two years when I was a fellow, I looked at all the different teams we covered and, and different players that came from different parts of the league and they had imaging at our institution. And the most common indication for imaging that I found was rule out fracture, okay? So again, really, really common. I'm gonna show you guys another video here. This is what the defenseman, Ryan McDonough, and he jumps right in front of the puck there, as you can see. And then here you can see right there, he puts his hand down and he gets hurt so badly that he drops his stick. So here you can see that there. So what this player ended up having was he had, a, as you can see here, is an intraarticular fracture of his index finger metacarpal. And it's a very common injury. We see this all the time. Like the more you look, the more you see it. Two weeks later, one of the right wingers did the exact same thing and again has this intraarticular fracture, a little comminuted. You can see part of the fracture line here as well, and then that little bit of step off right there. So, just very, very common to get uh, are these puck injuries. So, someone who is much smarter than I, the guys at Mallinckrodt and Rick Wright, who used to be the orthopedic surgeon for the St. Louis Blues, they kind of were seeing this as, as well, and they found that a lot of times these fractures were radiographically occult. So another reason that it's always good to get an MRI in these players. Um, they found 31 acute injuries occurred in 27 players, 17, in, 17 of those injuries. So over half were caused by a direct blow, 15 were from a moving puck. And then they also found interesting that 14 of the 17 involved the medial bone. And that's because a lot of times you'll see the player can just extra, quickly externally rotate their foot and the puck will hit the inside of their skate, which is very poorly protected and there's just no padding there. So that's a very common place in hockey players that you'll see a fracture. So this is an example from their paper. This is a 19 year old professional hockey player. And here you can see on this AP view of the foot, you really can't see anything, it looks pretty normal, but he had a fracture of his navicular when you got the MRI. So just a very common place that these players um, will get injured. But sometimes it's, it's not the puck, okay? So sometimes it's the player themselves. So there you see Zizermand goes right into the boards and we'll see this in a instant replay here. So there he just directly hits the boards right there with his foot. This was a pretty bad injury as you can see. 
And again, you can see, again, he can't even skate. His ankle hurts him so badly. So when we got the radiograph, you know, obviously might say, oh, you, I don't know if you need the MRI. You can see, obviously, he's got a fibular fracture here. We got, but we ended up getting an MRI because of the severity of the injury. And again, he's got a lot of soft tissue edema here, and we'll go through some of the other findings in his MRI. So we're here on this straight coronal uh, proton density. You can see that he's got a full thickness tear of both the deep and superficial fibers of his deltoid. Then as we move on here, you can see that his interosseous ligament is just a full thickness tear right there as we imaged him a little more cranially. And then he's got a full thickness tear of his anterior tibiofibular ligament. So this is what you would call if you're at a bar with your buddies, it's called a high ankle sprain or really an eversion ankle injury. And this was a traumatically induced eversion ankle injury. Now these are really bad actors and, and somewhat uncommon in the NHL, but these are really common in the NFL. I see these all the time and studies have shown that they occur with frequency of about 25% in the NFL. And these are important because rather than a, just a normal inversion ankle injury, these players are gonna require significantly more time and recovery for their return to the sport. So um, again, Rick Wright and a couple other smart orthopedic surgeons looked at these syndesmotic sprains or high ankle sprains in NFL players. And they looked at the training room records from 93 to 2007. 43 of these players were diagnosed with syndesmotic ankle injuries and underwent radiographs and MRI. Then they had a blinded MSK radiologist interpret these. And this is where it really shows where radiology is really important in the care for these players because the MRI demonstrated increased injury was, an, if the MRI demonstrated increased injury grade, that was an important predictor of prolonged disability. And also they found that combined tenderness with return to sport. So the worse the MRI looked, the longer the player was gonna be out. So they really rely on us pretty heavily to interpret these exams correctly, and it's really important in the care of the player and also the team in getting the player back. So for this guy, this is, in my opinion, maybe the ABR should be asking questions like this. I thought I'd let you guys kind of think about this yourself. So you saw the video of the injury, you saw the imaging findings of the injury. So how many games did this guy miss? Didn't now remember this is in season. So his surgery, and was he out for the season? Was he out for six weeks? Is his career ending? Did he, this player never play again? Or did he miss two practices? Well, you guys think about that for a second. But this guy was only out, this guy was, oh, well, not only out, he was out for six weeks. So this is kind of, you know, a really bad actor. And when you have these high ankle sprains, um, it's gonna just take the player a long time to get back to sport. Okay, there's another example here of a collision injury. Here the player loses control. Rick Nash flies into the boards. When this happened, when we saw the injury and they got imaging, we really weren't sure what happened to him. It looks like he hit his head. He definitely did hit his head. But as you can see, when he's trying to skate off the ice, he can't skate on his, on his left foot. So he's holding his left foot and he's just skating on one leg. And this was interesting because this kind of correlated with what Rick Wright and the guys in St. Louis had kind of found before. So when we got the radiograph at the stadium, there's really nothing going on. And this was on January 25th, but here we can see that he's got what looked to be a bone contusion, but he had a lot of periostitis here, a lot, way more than you might see with a bone contusion. Here, when we kind of zeroed in and did a small field of view, you can see here that he's got this, the beginnings of a fracture right there in his, tibia. And here you can see that soft tissue periostitis surrounding his tibia. And maybe, maybe we can kind of see a little bit of a fracture there. But this guy was having really significant pain, we tried getting him back to practice. He could practice a little bit, but then it, it hurt him again. So it was kind of like hemming and hawing. So we got another MRI on February 5th. Here you can see the bone marrow edema pattern is really worsening, worsening soft tissue periostitis and edema here. And here we're beginning to see that fracture a little better, definitely worse bone marrow edema. And here we're seeing that fracture a little better. So because it's HSS, still having pain, we got another MRI. So on February 12th, 
we got another MRI and here you can see that you can really start to see that fracture really forming there and you can start to see it forming better right here, worse edema. So it was kind of using the MRI to gauge what, whether this player could get back on the ice and we didn't think he was ready yet. And then on February 26th, you can see we can really see that fracture now that's evolved, really bad bone marrow edema pattern. So it was really use the MRI to guide whether this player could play or not. And we just felt he just wasn't ready. He was just having a lot of increased pain. So this is what his radiograph looked like at three months. So here you can see that fracture is basically healed. But this was an interesting story. And this guy missed a significant amount of time just for this fracture. So he was out for eight weeks and he missed 20 games. Okay. So sometimes these fractures can really, really, really hinder a player. So this is an example of an injury I probably see the most commonly. These are considered dirty hits. And it's where these are just examples of different players using this hit where they kind of put their knee out and try to hit the other player's knee. This is probably the best one I've seen coming up right here. Here this is on Stefan. And you can see that the guy just lets his knee out and he kind of flips over him. So these can be really, really devastating injuries. These players, you know, usually it's a pretty big penalty for doing that. So this is an example of kind of one of the bad actors of, of this injury. So we see these medial collateral ligament injuries all the time. But why this is such a bad actor is when they occur distally, it's, the, it's definitely a more substantial injury for the player. If they end up getting a stenor lesion, then that could be operable. So here you can see that this is a distal medial collateral ligament injury. And these are very, very, very bad actors. It's always good to alert the orthopedic surgeon. This like deserves a phone call. And this player was out for three weeks. So these just don't tend to heal like the more common proximal collateral, medial collateral ligament tears. So a lot of people have looked at this. You, just to review the anatomy, the MCL is attached proximally to the medial femoral condyle and then distally to that met metaphyseal area of the tibia. And it goes about four or five centimeters distal to the medial joint line and it's beneath the pes. So if you get a, a bad injury like you see here, you can end up getting a stenor lesion. And, and oftentimes I've seen it in the NFL and I've also seen it in the NHL that these players will actually end up getting operated on. Because the problem is it just doesn't really heal very well down there. It doesn't heal like it does if you have an injury to the femur. So the mechanism of injury, it's a valgus, an external rotation force to the lateral knee. Um, Non-contact is usually milder. All these uh, NHL injuries are almost always um, direct blows, however they happen, player to player or player to board. Um, and a direct blow, if it's bad enough, can cause complete disruption of the, uh, of the MCL. And the rupture usually occurs at the femoral insertion of the ligament. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. So um, different uh, layers of the MCL, you, we kind of divide it up as this has been going on for a while, layer one, layer two, and then layer three. And layer one is the deep fascia encom encompassing the patellar tendon anteriorly and the popliteal fossa posteriorly. Layer two is the MCL proper and Layer three is the medial capsular ligament that blends posteriorly with layer two to form the posterior oblique ligament. So people have looked at isolated grade three injuries. This was a study that was um, performed a while ago at uh, the University of Connecticut. And they looked at 35 athletes and 19, 19 of 34 patients estimated uh, full recovery to be under two months and 33 uh, patients were able to return to full participation in pre-injury sport, and 16 of the 19 players returned to sport within four weeks after the injury. So grade threes can be kind of worse actors, and these are all they're talking about um, proximal tears here. So I'm gonna show you an example of that. Here's a 39-year-old uh, center who was injured in practice after a collision. And here you can see that this guy has a proximal MCL tear, really high grade on the sagittal. We can see all the edema surrounding that. So this is, I would say, to me, this is like grade two slash three-ish, so it looks really bad on imaging. Well, one of the things we can offer these players is this player they sent to me, 
and we could do an, uh, an ultrasound on him. So here you can see the ultrasound. I had him laying on his side. And you can nicely use the MRI to correlate with the ultrasound where the tear is, where the red arrow is the tear there. And then over here, you can see my needle coming in right here to inject PRP. So this works really well for these guys and these type of injuries. I've seen a lot of success with um, these acute MCL tears and using PRP when the player's in season to kind of get them back on track. So it was kind of cool. So this guy missed zero games and scored a power play goal three days later. So PRP, you probably hear about a lot in the media. Almost everybody's using it. Um, certainly, we are doing it a lot for our players. Um, I do a lot of work with the Brooklyn Nets, and I'm injecting their patellar tendons all the time. But you, you can put PRP almost anywhere. Um, just how it works a little bit. This is kind of something you probably have words you haven't heard since medical school. Um, but it's got a lot of growth factors. You know, it promotes the, PR, the platelets promote angiogenesis. They have uh, keratinocyte growth factor. So the platelets kind of have all this really, really good stuff. And what we do is we just, we take the player's blood and we have a little Arthrex device that we spin it down and we can get that platelet concentration to five to, to 10 times greater than their normal platelets. And it becomes like this little yellow goo and then we just inject that back into them. So it's very safe, um, but, you know, and it's, and it's a very attractive uh, therapy for these athletes um, to deliver these cytokines in, in physiologically relevant proportions. Um, and really, there's a lot of compelling basic science data. So kind of the bench work data on PRP is really good. However, as you guys probably know, really mixed data on the effect of PRP for sports related injuries. So, um, you know, we use it a lot in our professional athletes, um, but it's not covered by insurance. So you don't see um, a ton of it being used in just the kind of weekend warrior. Um, Cause I think it's, I think we charge about $3,000 for an injection. So, and that's not covered by insurance. These players don't care cause they're not picking up the bill. So. So here's just player one versus player two. We can see the two different types of MCL injuries. This player with that distal MCL missed three weeks. And then the player with the more proximal, what looks like to be a pretty bad MCL, missed zero games. So we're gonna switch a little bit to hand and wrist injuries. I know I showed a couple fractures, but we're gonna go over kind of more some of the common injuries I see um, in hand and wrist for NHL players. Actually, it's, these injuries are so common that the orthopedic surgeon for the New Jersey Devils, or one of them, is actually a hand surgeon. So, so he's used, utilized quite frequently. And I couldn't show uh, an NHL talk without showing a fight. So this is Jordan Tutu. I worked with him a little bit when he was on the Devils. And apparently, he had told me that these two guys absolutely, they hate each other. So. I don't even think there was a check. They just wanted to fight because they don't like each other. So one of the injuries I've seen with this is this is an example of a player. It wasn't Jordan. It was a different player who had ulnar sided wrist pain after a fight. And so when we got the MRI, you know, on the axial proton density, it's hard to say if there's really anything going on there. But I knew he had ulnar sided wrist pain. We don't traditionally do an axial IR. So... Um, what I kind of led my eye was I saw all of this edema kind of tracking down here, but the ECU tendon looked okay, but we'll go into it a little more detail here. So what you can see here is that he actually has a tear of his extensor subsheath, and he was complaining that his ECU tendon seemed to be subluxing after he got in this fight. So here you can see it here, and then you don't see really anything right there. If you don't believe me, I can show you kind of, this is a more normal one. The subsheath I find is very hard to look at on a normal MRI, um, but when it's torn, I think it kind of shows itself a little more. So this is from Rad Source. I apologize, I didn't label this image, but this is not my image, this is from Rad Source, which is, I think, just a phenomenal um, resource for MSK radiologists. Um, here's the extensor retinaculum that you can kind of see right there. And then here you can see this is a guy with an intact subsheet. So you can kind of track that tissue all the way around. Again, when it's not torn, it's a little harder to 
kind of see. But here, if you if we mag up on this guy here, we can see there his his extensor retinaculum. And then here we can see that subsheath that just isn't totally making it all the way there. So the the surgeon never didn't really believe me. So we took him to the ultrasound suite, and I was able to show that his ECU tendon was subluxing. You can actually see that torn uh, subsheath right there. It just went backwards. So here you can see it just snap right there. So here you can look, if you look here, you can see that snap. So you saw that snap right there. So this is a nice way that ultrasound can kind of complement what you see on the MRI because you can actually sublux the tendon and demonstrate that torn subsheath. So this is a, another thing that I've seen pretty pretty darn frequently. Um, this is a NHL center with a worsening wrist pain. And there was no trauma involved here. I love this picture. I love that. Um, but uh, so this guy kind of came into us. The indication for the study was a scaphalunate ligament tear. So we did a wrist MRI, but then when we saw some of the bone marrow edema in his metacarpal, we repositioned the coil to kind of look at his more do a hand MRI rather than a wrist MRI. What we saw was this. So here he's got this osteoidium. I call this an osteoidium when the bone doesn't connect to the bone. Sometimes, you know, to me, a carpal boss just is continuous bone that comes, but when it's a separate bone that's forming a synchondrosis, to me, that's an osteoidium. You could tell it was giving him a lot of pain because he's got a stress reaction in his metacarpal. And then he's got the ganglion cyst right here that's kind of forming. So he's had a lot of arthritis there. It's been bothering him a long time. We thought this was interesting. We started seeing this a lot more in players. It's kind of like the more you look, the more you find. And so we, so we took a look at all the players that we saw over um, a couple years here. And we published a very small case series, but I think it's very relevant. And especially if you're looking at NHL players, this is always something you should have in the back of your mind. So we looked at 16 professional players, four different teams, and we found that actually 13 of those 16 players, 81% had nostoidium. We found that of those players, 10 had that in their leading wrist. So meaning it was, it was this wrist and not this wrist. And we found that very commonly, that it was usually their re leading wrist. 10 out of the 11 players demonstrated bone marrow edema pattern within the metacarpal or within the os. Um, when we did an MRI. So I think this is something just to always keep in the back of your mind. I can't tell you the amount of times I, can't, I end up seeing this in players. Now, whether it's symptomatic or not, um, is not always, it's not always their problem, but you just tend to pick up on them. And you can really help a player because this can kind of go undiagnosed. So this is just an example of a nice one from the paper where you can see that osteoidium, that kind of synchondrosis and all the secondary arthritis that's forming in this player's wrist. So there's a companion case of one of the 26-year-old center from the Penguins. And this guy had a really bad one. And here you can see that there's a lot of bone marrow edema in it. Here you can see again, he's forming that ganglion cyst again related to the arthritis. And this guy actually went on to have this resected and he's doing great, still playing in the NHL and crushing it. So um, again, it's just a, something to look out for and a, kind of some something that people don't always think about in hockey players. Okay, so I'll spend probably the remaining amount of time talking about the hip. Um, so the head team surgeon for the Rangers is a hip guy, uh, Brian Kelly, and you know he's taught me as much about the hip as, um, as a lot of radiologists have. So I've learned really a lot working with him. And this is a great paper that he and uh, Dr. Betty from the University of Michigan wrote. If you guys are ever interested, it kind of goes over everything. Um, they go from extra-articular to intra-articular to hip mimicking injuries. And I'm going to kind of follow the lead of that paper and show you guys my personal experience with that. The hard thing with the hip is when you examine the hip as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon, it's, it's, there's just so much going on in the hip. A lot of times it's hard for them to kind of differentiate intra-articular from extra-articular pathology. So they really rely on you and they rely on the MRI to kind of guide their physical exam because sometimes their physical exam is a little questionable and they can't really tell where the injury is coming from or the pathology is. So the adductor is very complex. You know, you have six muscles 
um, along the inner thigh, originate from the pubis and insert along the medial side of the femur. This is a picture from that paper. And the adductor is really kind of like a hot topic in hockey right now. So now as we, you know, I think we've pretty well figured out the phases of throwing in a pitcher. Here now in hockey, what we're all starting to talk about is kind of the phases of skating. So people that are a lot smarter than I am have found that the adductor is highly activated at the end of the push-off phase. So this is this would be an example of the push-off phase. So here you can see this is one of the fastest skaters in the NHL. Um, and here you can see that there's this line is drawn showing you the push-off phase of skating. And that's an, and when that happens, that's a decelerating eccentric contraction. And then they get a powerful concentric contraction during the recovery phase. And that's when this, this leg will be brought back. And I'll show you guys an, an example of that. So really fast skaters, guys that like really cruise on the ice, really have a high rate of these muscle strains. It's always something to think about in the back of your mind. So this is just an example of the phases of skating. And here you can see that the push off phase really well in the recovery phase, and you kind of get in a sense of how you can really injure your adductor when skating. So this is just a nice example of an adductor tear with, from a 27 year old center. He was, he had pain when he was skating in practice. They were doing a lot of skating drills that day. Um, and you can see that injury really, really nicely on the MRI. And it's always something to think about in ice hockey players. This is kind of a, a little different injury, but still um, an adductor injury. This is from that paper, uh, the hip and ho ice hockey. I thought this was just a nice example um, of an adductor longest tear. And then you can see kind of it's involving uh, some of the other adductors. So you can see the pectineus there on the right and then involving a little bit of the gracilis. So all these kind of adductors can be involved in these, um, in these adductor strains. This is probably one of the, the worst ones if you have a adductor longus avulsion, which definitely can happen. Here you can see that that tendon is ripped off. Usually though, for these injuries, it's not really um, a, uh, a hard thing to figure out for the surgeon because what they'll do is when, they'll, when they examine them, they'll feel for that defect and they can feel that pretty easily. So usually they just want to see the degree of injury it is, but they can, they can really push their thumb there and figure out that, that there's a tendon missing compared to the other side. So usually not a diagnostic dilemma, but MRI is always helpful. And here you can see that it's just, there's a big hole in the bone there where the longus is just completely ripped off. So the hip flexors are also another very common injury um, in the NHL. Um, these players, when they examine them, will have difficulty with passive hip extension and resisted hip flexion. They can have tenderness um, in the area of the hip flexor. But again, it's very hard to diagnose these by physical examination. So this is a, just a nice uh, example of an iliopsoas tendon tear from a 22-year-old NHL right winger. He had groin pain. They were we're really not sure what was going on, but here you can see that it's it's torn way down at the um, distally at it, at the insertion of the iliopsoas, and the iliopsoas is really set up to be injured. So um, this is a slide that was given to me for, by Brian Kelly, and really you can have a lot of psoas impingement because if you have an increased femoral antiversion, you really will overload that psoas. So some of these hockey players with increased femoral antiversion are already set up to have these iliopsoas injuries. And it, and it has a really intimate association with the capsulolabral ligamentous complex. And in that way, it's sometimes hard to differentiate an iliopsoas tendon tear from a labral tear. So a lot of times that's why we get an MRI. We can do a lot for these players in season if they get this injury. This is an example. Here you can see the iliopsoas tendon is here. And here you can see that there's um, a muscle tear right here. And what we do is we can put our ultrasound probe down. I like it exactly in this position when I do it. And we have a really nice visualization to put our needle down. I, and this is an example here of the iliopsoas tendon. Here's my needle coming down. I might be a little too high. It looks like I'm about to stab it. Hopefully I reposition my needle and you can land it right here. What I do then is I inject lidocaine at that point. And then I want to just see that tendon float. And once that tendon floats, I'm confident I'm in the bursa right here and you can start to see it flow around really, really nicely. But that's what I always look for when I do these um, injections is I put my needle down on the bone 
and then you want to see that tendon float cranially. So hip pointers obviously are very common injuries. They're common in the NFL, also very common in the NHL, and they kind of come in all different flavors. Um, here's an example. Players really like to use their hips when they when they hit other players. This is called what's called a hip check. This is a pretty good one. As you can see, the players just spin all the way around in the air and land. You can imagine how much that hurts, not only the guy that got hit, but the player doing it. So this is an example of one of our, one of our defensemen with a hip pointer injury. And you can see all of this, this edema here and then a little edema in the bone and just edema surrounding the, the soft tissues right here. And just a nice example of what these hip pointers look like. And again, these are very common injuries. And really, really, they hurt a lot. A lot of times these players come in, they have large bruises over their hip, um, but don't miss a ton of time from doing this. This was kind of a different one where we saw a hematoma within the iliacus after the guy got checked into the board. So a little different um, injury than we saw before. But like I said, these can come in all different flavors. And this is just another uh, example of a hematoma within the iliacus. So hip mimicking injuries, sports hernia, athletic pubalgia, core muscle injury, whatever you want to call it, um, this condition comprises a large proportion of groin-related injuries. So over two seasons of play, they looked at this in 99, abdominal muscle strains or sports, or sports hernia, whatever you want to call it, were found to account for 23% of all the players who presented with a groin-related strain. So this is, a, again, another picture from the paper, The Hip and Ice Hockey. Again, a great paper that I think you guys should look at. But basically, the reason I'm showing this slide is I think people get a little um, stressed out when they're reading like a sports hernia or the athletic pubalgia. And I really don't think it's, it's that complicated or maybe I'm just not that smart. Um, but I just think of it as the pubic symphysis acts as a fulcrum for the anterior pelvis, right? And so, you know, you have, you have the rectus abdominis pulling this way, and then you have the adductors pulling this way, and then you have the pubic symphysis and that adductor plate or aponeurosis, whatever you call it, coming over. I kind of think of it like the extensor mechanism in the knee, and I don't think it needs to be a lot more complicated than that. So this is very common. This is a 24-year-old right winger with groin pain after shooting a slap shot, and typically that's what you will hear these guys present with when they have um, athletic pubalgia. It hurts when they're stick handling. They'll say, doctor, it hurts when I'm like shooting. I get this intense, sharp pain when I'm shooting. So it's that twisting injury, that's that the twisting motion that they do um, using their core muscles to do these high powered slap shots or if they're passing or anything like that. That's typically, I typically don't hear them complain about skating. It's more about shooting and passing. So here, if you watch this, we're gonna just scroll through here. This is just a nice example of a, here you can see that cleft sign um, where there's just a defect where the arrow is, where, where there's a tear in the aponeurosis. Here, this is it's kind of a different aponeurotic tear and it's going very far posteriorly, but we can follow it. The nice thing, this is kind of like, it's like reading neuroradiology, right? You can look, always look at the other side to compare and say, wait, that looks different than there. So that's the nice thing. And again, I'm not a very smart man, so, um, it's, an, it's an easy way to kind of diagnose these injuries, and you can see that tear just propagates very, 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 very far posteriorly. Again, here you can see that cleft. That's abnormal. It should be, I always tell my fellows, it's black to bone. So you want to see that aponeurosis, black to bone, and this is here you can see that nice fluid-filled cleft there. And we keep going back. You can kind of see it go all the way back. So this is just this I took from um, Zoga's very nice article in radiographics, and it's a very, very nice diagram, I think, where you see the rectus come down, here's the pubic symphysis, here's that aponeurosis into the adductor longus, and you can see that really, really nicely here. This is that tear that we were seeing on that coronal MRI. This should be all black right here. This is abnormal. When you see this, this is an aponeurotic tear. So in case you don't believe me, I'll just show you his other side. So on the right, this is normal. This is what the aponeurosis should look like. And this was his left side, the pathologic side. And you can see it's just stripping this whole thing off. 
kind of almost like a delaminating cartilage injury. So there you see that. And there's, there's the extent of that tear going anterior to posterior. And this is just a sagittal MRI through the pubic symphysis. And there's a normal appearance, so black to bone. So if it's in season, you know, we're going to try to treat these guys non-operatively. We'll do physical therapy. And a lot of times these guys will, will inject them. And we can inject them with steroid in the season um, as long as they're not planning on getting operated on right after the season. So they've got about three months left. We can inject them with steroid. We can also do PRP. Again, we do this with ultrasounds. Pretty darn easy as long as you can prevent the guy from valsalving. So I just put the probe right there. I go in short axis, right over the pubic symphysis. Needle drops right down. And there you can see my needle there. And then there's an example of kind of, you can start to see the pubic symphysis starts to kind of distend a little bit. Um, but a pretty simple injection as long as the player kind of um, doesn't foul salva. That's the hardest thing I know. It's, interestingly, this is an extraordinarily common injury in UFC fighters as well. That's those are probably the people I do it the most on as far as professional athletes. So, you know, we've been talking about extra-articular. We talked about kind of the hip mimicker. So now let's talk about intra-articular pathology, specifically FAI. So FAI is a very hot topic right now. Um, in, in what it is is just pathological contact when you have an abnormally shaped femoral head with the acetabulum. Um, and this can result in early labral and chondral damage. And the most common cause of labral tears are osseous morphologic changes that have been seen in up to 80% of patients with symptomatic tears, and that was published in CORE. So how I approach the hip, again, is kind of, I try to think of myself in a little bit as a clinician. Um, you know, the clinician's gonna have, hear about the injury history, use their clinical exam, and then they're going to use a radiographic or a mechanical diagnosis. And then you really want to differentiate again with when you're thinking about hip, is this intraarticular? So is it going on in the joint? Is there damage to the cartilage? Is there a labral tear? Or is this kind of extraarticular and all those other things that we were thinking about? And I think of this as a layered approach. When I read a hip MRI, I kind of think about it the same way that they do. So I think about the osteochondral layer, the mechanics of the joint. Is there an abnormally shaped femoral head? Is there over containment? Does this guy have kind of what's called a pincer? Is this combined? Is there hip dysplasia? So what is the layer one is the bone layer. Then I kind of take that bone layer to the inert layer. So what about the cartilage? What about the labrum? What, is, what does that look like? How is layer one having an effect on layer two? Dynamic layer would be everything else around all the, um, all the tendons ligaments, things like that, some extra articular injuries. And then uh, lastly, you want to think about maybe the neural layer. Is there some, is there something else kind of going on? Piriformis syndrome, I don't know. So layer one has an effect on layer two. So that abnormal bone causes cartilage injury. It causes labral tears. So each layer has an effect kind of on the other layer. So this is just a nice example um, from JBJS in 2006 of a very nice, when you see that frog la lateral view on the right, you can see that massive cam lesion. This guy probably has an alpha angle of about 80. Um, here you can see what they're doing here is, this is um, uh, a view from the hip uh, anteriorly, and you can see this huge bump here. This is what that, um, what the lesion looks like, that cam lesion. And here you can see he's kind of shaving it down and restoring that anatomic contour to the femoral head. So the way these injuries happen is what, what happens is that you have this large cam lesion here and the cam lesion is gonna impinge on the superlateral labrum during flexion and internal rotation. And what you really have is First, the labrum doesn't tear, it really separates. So you get this chondral labral separation here because it's kind of, the forces are directed this way and it's kind of pulling it this way. So what really happens first is you get separation at that chondral labral junction. Then you're gonna start to get cartilage injury and labral tear as well. So the first thing I really wanna look for is that chondral labral separ separation. You wanna see if there's delamination. 
Um, again, Mark Philippon at Invale has really made his career on FAI and has characterized this pretty well. I thought this was an interesting study, what they found. He, in Vail, he looked at 61 asymptomatic youth hockey players, 10 to 18. And then for controls, he looked at skiers. And he found that the ice hockey players had significantly higher alpha angles than the control group. And there was a significant correlation between age and increased alpha angles. 75% had an alpha angle greater than 55. And hockey players are four and a half more times likely to have an alpha angle associated with cam impingement than the skiers. So why, you know, why do hockey players all have FII? I mean, literally all these guys have it. I don't think anyone really knows. Probably repetitive axial loading and hip flexion, what they've been doing since they were like a fetus. Maybe some genetic predisposition, or maybe it's kind of the overgrowth of the physis when they were skeletal and mature and skating, you know, 9 million hours a day that you kind of got that proliferative bone there. So no one really totally knows. But I think it's important when you're imaging these, I think the most important thing that I learned is you really want to orient, you want to get like an oblique axial. So you really want to lot when you're plotting, you want it kind of in line with the femoral neck here. And then you'll get a really nice shot of what that anterior cam lesion looks like. So this guy had a massive cam lesion here and you really wouldn't see that if you just scan straight down so you really want to do a form of an oblique axial image and that's what we do in all of our hips so what does chondrolabral separation look like it looks like you get a fluid intensity signal intensity cleft at that chondrolabral junction and you can have labral detachment or you cannot you always want to look for contracule injury and the same thing when you talk about an acl how you get that contracoup injury over the posterior aspect of the medial tibial plateau and the ramp lesions that everyone's are talking everyone's talking about. You can also get that contracoup injury in cam femoroacetabular impingement to the posterior inferior labrum. So you want to really look there. And also you, you're really not going to be confused because sublabral recesses don't occur anterior superiorly. What hip surgeons will always tell you that their life lives from 12 to 3. So, so you're really not going to be confused with that. And here is an example of that chondrolabral separation where you're starting to delaminate the cartilage right there. This is kind of an orth arthroscopic correlation from the paper. So here you can see that there's a, a full thickness tear through the labrum. Here, this is the labrum, this is the articular cartilage here, and here you can see that's that chondrolabral separation. That's what it looks like on a scope. Like that is kind of like that. The labrum here is torn, it's all bloody. And then this is kind of that chondrolabral junction right here where the arrows are. So kind of take you through a case. This is a 24 year old right winger who's had the, the guys had like left hip pain forever. So here you can see he's got that massive cam lesion right there. You can kind of see it a little bit on the AP, but, but a very, very large cam lesion. I think he had an alpha angle of like 81. Um, you can see that bump right there. So what does his MRI look like? So here is his MRI, and here you can see that chondrolabral separation. There's delamination of cartilage. He's got focally exposed bone here. Here you can see it again nicely. And then here is a really nice finding on this sagittal. You can see that this layer of cartilage is still intact, but this is all bad loss of grayscale stratification. This is what I call impending delamination of cartilage. So and you can see it's all bright right here, and this would be more normal cartilage here. That's typically what we see. This is what the hip surgeons will call the wave sign when they go in with a scope. So they'll put the scope in, and uh, the cartilage will look normal here, but when they probe it, it kind of gets like a wave, and when they turn the water on, it starts like kind of going like that. So that's kind of the equivalent, our MRI, to their wave sign. There you can see it all the way there. So this is kind of what it looks like. I'm gonna play this photo. This is an example that one of the surgeons gave me of the wave sign. So there he's probing that cartilage right there, that chondrolabral junction, and you can see it's just kind of loose and floaty, and it's not really very, very good cartilage. So we've looked at, I, I think about 15 years ago, um, hip, uh, Butterfly goalies was kind of an unusual thing. Patrick Waugh was arguably the first butterfly goalie, but now I think almost everybody's a butterfly goalie. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting 
study is they looked at the, the characterization of hip impingement in butterfly goalies versus non-butterfly goalies. And they found that they really have a unique cam and they found that they have obviously an elevated alpha angle, but they found that it was more lateral lesion. So um, as compared to non-butterfly goalies, they also found that acetabular dysplasia, not surprisingly, is overall very common in goalies. And that's kind of probably what, what gives them their ability to go into the butterfly position. So these are kind of more unusual, but I think very important injuries. So this is a 32-year-old goalie with trauma. He got hit in the neck and it was totally exposed. So what this guy actually had was a short segment ICA dissection. And you can kind of see that right there. I'm not a, I'm not a neuroradiologist, but when you look kind of to the contralateral side, you can see that all this on this T1 image, all that bright signal is all hematoma um, consistent with a dissection. And you can see that there as well, um, kind of a diminutive appearing short segment internal carotid artery at this point. So this guy actually was treated non-operatively. It's a, that's a hard place to get to for, to put any kind of stent, um, kind of kept him on Plavix. He was out for a while, but still playing in the NHL and still doing okay. Um, so there's a 24 year old defenseman with a painful lump in the foot. And this I found to be a very interesting injury. This is kind of what it looked like. I just stole this from the literature. He's got all that soft tissue swelling medially. And what this is is a medial bursitis. At the kind of as the season goes on, or if you get really deep into the playoffs, this becomes a very common injury. And it's just um, friction from their skate. And a lot of times we, you know, you can diagnose it clinically with ultrasound. We sometimes aspirate these. Uh, but a lot of times when these players have this kind of medial sided pain, they're always wondering, oh, does, do they have a deltoid tear? Or is there something else going on? Or is this just the bursitis? So that's a lot of times why we're actually getting the MRI um, on these players. And here you can see it right, right there. Um, this has been pretty well characterized in, in figure skaters and ice hockey players and, and speed skaters. Um, sometimes these things can get infected. I've definitely seen that before, and that can be a, a, a very big problem. They can use uh, protective padding. Um, sometimes we'll just inject these with steroid or try to drain them. Um, the players have told me it's really interesting that um, Americans tend to get these more than Canadians. The reason being that Americans grow up playing indoors mostly. Um, they don't play outside as much as Canadians do. And when you play indoors, you can tighten up your skate and you can put your skate really tight. But the Canadians have told me problem with playing outside in Canada is that it's so damn cold, your feet get cold if you tie your skates too tight. So Canadians typically have looser skates and are less likely to get this compared to Americans or someone who grew up kind of playing indoors, which I found very interesting. That's unpublished, obviously. Um, this is a 27 year old with shoulder pain. There's another common injury um, that I see. He's got edema in the, in the posterior aspect of his rotator cuff. And this is, he's got a posterior Hagel. So this guy had a posterior shoulder dislocation. Um, there's no real definitive treatment for these posterior shoulder dislocations. A lot of times um, these players are able to get back and play pretty quickly as long as there's, you know, they don't have a huge um, reverse hill sacks or, or reverse bank heart. And these typically are not as bad actors. They, they look a lot worse. Um, then they actually, they look a lot worse on MRI than the player usually does. So this player with this posterior shoulder dislocation just missed one game. Um, again, these posterior Hagels can come in all shapes and sizes. You can see an avulsion um, from the bone, uh, or sometimes you can just see like one of my partners likes to call, call this the secondary, um, like an accordion sign when you start to see that posterior capsule. Um, kind of start to get a little wavy. You want to think about um, a posterior Hagel. And these have been pretty well characterized in the literature. Had This is an example of a low-grade injury, and that, surprisingly, that's all that our player had in that sense. So this would kind of be a grade one AC joint separation. You can just see edema within the capsule. This is an example of a player with a worse one. He has widening of the AC joint right there, and you can see the like stripping of the capsule up here. And this is a type two AC joint separation. This is kind of what, for the residents, uh, what a normal AC joint looks like. 
Um, here you can see those coracle clavicular ligaments, the colonoid and trapezoid portions just look really normal right there, normal low signal intensity. There's no widening of the joint here. Where in this patient who had a type 3 AC joint injury, he's got a little tear within his lateral trapezius. And you can see here that he's got a full thickness tear of his coracoclavicular ligaments. And even these type 3s, these players don't miss a lot of time, and they usually can get back to playing within a couple games. Um, this is a little worse one. With a, This is a type 4 where it's you've got real, really bad tearing of the um, and edema here with tearing of the trap, a little tearing of the deltoid. And on this axial, you can see that that clavicle is buttonholing um, through the muscle right up there. So these are a little worse actors. A lot of times these have to get surgery to kind of reduce um, that joint and get it back um, anatomically. This was an interesting case um, of a cervical rib. So this is a player with arm swelling during practice. And this guy had ended up having thoracic outlet syndrome on the MRI. You can see that his vein is thrombosed right there. And that was due to this cervical rib that he had. And these are somewhat common. You know, we've seen them in different players around the league. And, you know, these guys have to undergo uh, surgery to remove that. But then, you know, after the surgery, a lot of them get back to playing and do pretty well. Um, this is an, this is kind of a more rare injury. There's a 19 year old right winger and he had anterior shoulder pain after a check here. You can see he's got a, a fracture at costochondral junction right there. And then he's got fluid in his sternoclavicular joint and his meniscus is just completely torn here. You can see the fluid again with these sternoclavicular joints. It's nice to look compared to the other side where you can see that normal meniscus and there's no real fluid in the joint here. But here you can see that there's fluid right there and that meniscus is just totally gone. So it's a nice way to diagnose this injury. I see these in NFL players too. Um, here you can, again, it's almost like neuroradiology. You've got the contralateral side, which is normal. He's got a torn intercolicular ligament right here. And there's all this edema right here. It looks really, really abnormal. And here you can see here on the other side, it's just normal and low signal intensity. This guy's meniscus was actually okay. But again, you can tell this joint was injured because you got a lot of fluid in this joint right here. And then this side is just totally normal. All right. So I think in conclusion, um, fractures and hip related injuries predominate the role of imaging in the NHL. I think we, we kind of beat a dead horse there and I went every, through everything in the, uh, in the hip, but I think it's really important. Um, don't forget about the MCL and just in the type of injury it is, whether it's proximal or distal makes a big difference. And the radiologist really has a crucial role in the care of these, of these players and can really help out the team. So thank you, and I will open it up for questions right now. Hey, Dick. Uh, this is Philip. Uh, thanks for that talk. I have a list of questions here, and um, I can read them out to you whenever you're ready. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, so one said, nice videos and talk. Have you considered doing T2 Dixon imaging in fractures? The fracture lines are so well seen in our experience on a post face imaging as a care, as compared to PD. Um, so if you could comment on, um, your experience with T2 Dixon. Imaging. Yeah, we, we actually don't use, uh, use that, um, here at all for fractures. Um, kind of, we just do, um, proton density, all three planes and then one plane of IR. So, um, you know, I think that's a good point and something I could definitely look at, but um, yeah, usually not for fractures. We don't, we don't do anything kind of other than kind of routine. Um, sometimes I just like a simple T1 for a fracture. Um, you can kind of characterize it a lot better than you can um, other fractures. All right, um, the next question is, um, Going back to that um, ECU subsheath injury, how um, did you provoke the snapping when you do your physical, your dynamic exam on ultrasound? Yeah, so you kind of just like rotate the wrist. It's it's kind of like like uh, like riding a like a like a like a buck like a buck horse. It's you just keep the the probe on the wrist, and then I just rotate their wrist back and forth, um, or I just tell the patient they have different ways to elicit it. I'm like, how do you elicit it? And I just put the probe on. 
and then try to get them to be able to elicit it. It doesn't always work as well as it did in that guy. Um, and it can be very difficult because you're the wrist is moving and you just ask the patient to move it in the way that they can elicit that um, the snapping or when they feel it. So I've that's kind of how I do it. Yeah, that was a cool case. Um, in terms of your, I guess your FAI protocol, um, I know you we saw the those axial obliques that you did. Um, is there anything else in your FAI? FAI protocol, and do you think that um, MRA with or without traction is helpful or compared to 3T? Yeah, so um, I think that I've just recently learned about the traction. We don't do traction and we don't do arthrograms here, um, but I think the traction is something I've just recently heard about that I've found is very interesting because I think it's, it can be very difficult to look at the cartilage sometimes. Um, in just a normal, you know, no, even if you're doing like high res, what we do, cartilage imaging, um, I find characterization of cartilage in the hip joint can be somewhat challenging sometimes. And I think that distraction is actually an, an interesting possibility. Um, you know, I, I don't really think arthrograms, I, I, just me personally, I don't really have a lot of problems diagnosing uh, labral tears with without an arthrogram. And a lot of times it's not really the labral tear that's the most important thing. It's kind of all the other stuff. And I think the cartilage is really important because, you know, not in an, in a, in a, in elite young athletes, but, you know, in someone that's older, that's had FAI for a while, you want to kind of characterize where that cartilage loss is. So yeah, so they're like 40, they have a labral tear, who cares, but they've got a big bump. But the, what the surgeon is always asking me is like, how much cartilage loss do they have and where is the cartilage loss? So for hip arthroscopy, if you have any loss over the femur, most hip arthroscopists at that point will say, I'm not going in because it's, I can't really help this patient. So it's hip preservation. And at that point, if there's disproportionate loss over the femur, then it's like a no-go for arthroscopy, at least at, at our institution. Now the, they will tolerate a little bit of cartilage loss over the acetabulum because as I was showing you, and even those young players that went on to get hip arthroscopy, that's kind of the first place where cartilage go, where the cartilage loss occurs. So you're still getting it at a very early time point. But if you wait until there's cartilage loss over the femoral head, those patients just don't tend to do very well. And there have been tons of studies where they show inferior outcomes, inferior patient satisfaction after, um, after the scope. It's a long answer to that, sorry. No, thank you, that was very helpful. Um... And then one more question was just asking about whether you guys do intra-articular PRP. Um, yeah, not, not commonly, but um, there we do have a couple uh, surgeons who are doing uh, intra-articular PRP. Um, I do it, uh, one of the surgeons I read for and I do all his injections, the, he's the team doc for the Nets, and he does a lot of um, osteochondral allografts, and it's in his protocol like at six months post-op they get an injection with a combination of PRP and then also like a steroid concoction that he's invented. So I'm doing them all the time. So in those osteochondral allografts, it's just surgeon dependent. I've found that, you know, he thinks it kind of calms down the joint because um, a lot of times you can get a really bad inflammatory response. Um, but I've, I've heard of people doing it with people with cartilage loss and stuff like that. I, d I don't really think that works, but you know, if they want to do it, then, I'm okay with it. It's pretty safe. All right. Um, I think that does a, just as about does it for the questions. Adam, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to mention or. No, that, that's great. Thank you so much, Tay. We really enjoyed listening to you and you had some amazing cases and uh, I'm glad I never played hockey. That's all I, can <laughs> I only played for two years when I was a kid. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad I didn't keep playing. Smart man. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for watching and uh, we'll put this up on the YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days. So okay. stay safe everyone. And again, thank you, Tate. Yep. All right. Take all right.